How's everyone doing today? You guys enjoying the first Gamer X ever? Yeah. All right, good. Um, well, my name is Michael Anthony Deanda. Uh, I am here to talk about this game that I developed uh, called Transgression the Game, um, a game that I used to cha uh, challenge the masculine identity. Uh, and let me start off with a brief introduction about myself. Uh, that's me, I took that maybe six months ago while I was uh, sleep deprived in the lab working on my thesis. <laughs> uh, I was born in 1990 in El Paso, Texas. Gag. Um, and I went to school at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, got my bachelor's in interactive media and game development and philosophy. And my master's degree is uh, in interactive game development with a concentration in game studies and cultural theory. Um, and here I am with my um, wonderful and supportive parents who are here to watch me today. And that's my... And that's my sister and my brother-in-law who um, aren't, aren't here, but they're here with me in spirit. So I wanted to give them a shout out. Um, and finally, my game cover, Transgression. Um, so I wanted to give you guys a bit of my development processes in this um, in, in a way that I'm going to then discuss how uh, we can use games as a vehicle to talk about um, things that are difficult to otherwise uh, talk about, even with people that are close to us. So, um, the purpose of the project was to uh, challenge social conceptions of gender. And when we think of this, what, what do we generally think of gender? Uh, we have male and female. There's a binary, right? There's no really any gray area in society for those of us who don't necessarily fit in these categories to express ourselves. And when we do, we're often punished or shunned for it. Um, and so as I was thinking of what I was going to do for my master's thesis, I had to narrow it down because it, it was just too frustrating. There was a lot to do. I, I don't think I could have um, come up with an entire thing that like why, why this whole spectrum is, is just messed up because of the whole systemic change. So I decided to limit um, my project to, to the masculine identity alone, because um, that's something that I have personally experienced. Uh, I can write from it, and it can be a bit more personal. So in a sense, this, this game is me actually articulating, articulating my own gender identity as well, as um, trying to impact the uh, gaming industry. Um, so my vision or the product of this project was to provide a vehicle for uh, people that identify as, as gender queers to take uh, this game and be able to play it with people who are close to them that may not necessarily understand their own their gender identity um, and sit down play the game a couple times through and then reflect on it and say well this is how I'm feeling and you guys are important to me, and this is something that I, I feel I need to share with you. So the design concept behind the game was transgressive joy. Um, and this derived from a gay Latino uh, studies major, uh, Lawrence LaFountain Stokes, who actually contacted me after this was over. Very cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he, he discusses this idea of uh, sin vergüenza which uh, loosely translates to shamelessness, but there's something lost in that translation from Spanish to English. Um, in Spanish, the idea carries with, uh, the word carries with it an idea of resistance, um, and there's, there's a spectacle in this uh, transgression that's happening. So not only is it I am standing against you, it is, look at me, I am standing against you because I am badass. <laughs> okay, so 
uh, the rules of the game, printed on this cute little panel, um, are everyone begins with one fashion item. And I'll talk about the logistics of the printing process afterwards and how that impacted the game. Um, here, the game comes with eight fashion item cards, um, which have their uh, counterpart that you, people can purchase at party stores. Um, my mom and I actually made this boa. That's pretty awesome, right? Okay, everyone takes one fashion, whoa. <laughs> one fashion item, and um, the person who takes the, fo the, the boa goes first. Um, and this whole rule was a way, because all these items are gonna be on the table, and I don't think you can really play a game with a bunch of tool or chiffon on the table, because that would be really difficult. Um, so then player, okay, uh, the punishment deck is to be shuffled, and in here are cards that punish players for breaking the masculine rules, um, placed in the center of the table. The wardrobe deck is then shuffled, and this is the deck that um, tells players what to do. Uh, and then you separate the life cards into six groups, your family, your job, your friends, your drag family, your drag job, and your fans. And each player gets one family card, one job card, and the friend cards are divided evenly among players. Uh, the rest of the cards are put aside and saved for later, because as the game progresses, uh, the punishments make you lose your initial cards and you're trying to gain the other cards to help you support yourself. Um, because each of the cards has its own unique um, power that lets people play more cards or take more cards. Um, so on a turn, a player uh, draws a card from the wardrobe deck, plays cards as many as their, their cards in front of them allow, um, takes a punishment if any of their cards that they played broke a, a dude rule, which I call them, uh, <laughs> Because the one of the epitomes of, of the masculine identity is this like, bro, dude, what's up? <laughs> I might have been a bit too stonery, but you get the point. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they have to follow the punishment, and then the next uh, player proceeds. So the dude rules in the game are dress like a dude act like a dude, and don't rub up on other dudes. <laughs> because men aren't allowed to express their relationships as platonic as they may be with other men without thinking that it's gay. <laughs> okay, anyway, so John Huizinga, a play theorist, uh, discusses this concept of the magic circle. We're moving on to the theory part. Um, and I'm gonna to try to keep this as in entertaining as possible. So the magic circle is this theory that um, players are able to suspend reality when they enter into uh, play and game spaces. And in this circle, we are able to negotiate our identities without consequences in the real world. Um, and my idea of uh, Huizinga's theory was to then use this space as a way to impact how people think about uh, this gender binary and uh, the heteronormative uh, suffering that we're put through in everyday life uh, and really reflect on it, even, even cisgender players and, and straight players, uh, to gain a sense of empathy for other players, other people, not just players. And so in thinking about all of this, I wanted to use drag as the focus of, of the game. And I know this was a risky move, but um, drag is this way, it's, it's play as it is, but men actually um, put on an illusion and perform gender. Uh, so 
a guy can put on makeup, heels, uh, dress his wigs, and convince other people that he's a woman, or to the extent that we will let ourselves uh, fall under the illusion. And it's interesting how audiences even allow themselves to be convinced of this illusion too. Um, so thinking of uh, drag and reflecting on theories, I, I looked into um, Judith Butler's uh, gender performity for performativity theory, excuse me, I've said that word like many times, and somehow I mess it up here. Um, and Butler's theory of performativity, she discusses uh, the way that we talk about gender and the locus that we then use to discuss our bodies become these defining ways that we categorize ourselves into both sex and gender. So. It's interesting because she asks, is there another way that we can categorize this? Um, if we stop talking about um, features of maleness and femaleness, what's left at it? We're all really just bodies. And it's interesting because it seems like at the end of it, she wants to use this as a canvas that we can then use to discuss other ways of conceiving gender and sex. Um, and Susan Bordeaux uh, was also, she's more of a feminist theory, theorist, but she wrote this book on masculine identity. Um, and she links the masculine identity to phallus ideology, um, stating that men must always be hard, um, <laughs> ever present, uh, conscious, and they must be unyielding. So, and the phallus, as she discusses, isn't always represented by a penis because penises might be flaccid. But the phallus is always erect. Um, other ways that the phallus takes place is, uh, are in muscles, as we see over there. Um, very chiseled man. Um, in the glare that you're supposed to notice them uh, and in other statues, uh, anything that links itself to masculine power and the presence of, of maleness. Um, so how do we challenge all these? Um, Rupp and Taylor, they're two uh, theorists who decided to start looking into drag queens. And they actually went down to uh, Key West and uh, spent some time with some drag queens at the 801 Cabaret and wrote a book about it, and it's pretty interesting. Um, and in this book, they reflect on drag as a transgendered identity in the way that they will, on one hand, refer to themselves and each other as she or women, and then turn around and say he. Um, so then it brings about this way that we then have this complicated uh, vernacular and the way we talk about gender then becomes uh, complex and uh, strange. And then th uh, their other theory is that these drag performances aren't just for entertainment, they're actually uh, some uh, political resistance and politics here is used to um, define a power structure in which uh, people in one category have power over another. Um, so <laughs> how is drag then uh, political and resistance to this uh, way, of, this ideology of, of heteronormativity and masculinity and these power structures that men then are have power over women, why do we need all these, um, you know, th this huge system that's just messed up. Um, and then, so that's all the gender theory. Into game theory, uh, Ian Bogos is one of the leading theorists and he discusses procedural rhetoric, which uh, states that designers communicate 
their message in the games through players, through the rules of play. Um, so that the way you play is how you receive the message. And uh, Miguel Seacart, um, he critiques Bogos and he says, no, players actually have their own uh, way of interacting with games and designers can't actually fully create the entire message of a game because players always bring something to the table. And how many of you have played a video game and you start adding your own rules into it? <laughs> or using a game and playing by the rules? Or how many of you have played Uno and you turn the draw two card and then it stacks if the next person has a draw two card? <laughs> And the next person, it stacks if they have a draw two card. So then by the end of it, I'm stuck drawing like 20 cards and there's no hope for me winning ever. <laughs> I hate that. That's not in the rules. That's our own player agency. Um, and here's a cute little diagram that I made um, that uh, uses Bogos and C cards uh, theories. and. So we have the player who brings their own values and morals to the table. Uh, we have play that is the medium for uh, structured spaces, and we have the designer who promotes an agenda and a certain experience that they want. And we have um, <coughs> negotiating identities, challenging identities, and moderated framework in the middle of all of them. And in the center, we have games. So I included in the wardrobe, a way for players to get up away from the table and actually start um, challenging their own identities by uh, dancing, posing, and strutting that aren't typically masculine. Uh, because I wanted players to physically feel what it's like to perform gender, and that you can perform gender. Um, and this, I feel, is a way for players to then empathize with what it means for us to not always be locked into these rigid confines that society has taught us to. And here are a few of my um, fabulous uh, friends playing my game over at school. Um, they're beautiful. Uh, so winning the game, collecting if you're playing with three or fewer people, collecting five items, you win. If you're playing with four people, or yeah, with four people, collecting four of the items, uh, you win. And uh, there's the drag family clause that if a drag family ever, uh, the members ever get all the items, everyone wins in that family. So it's co-op, it's uh, competitive if you want. So what am I trying to <laughs> really show you here? Um, Part of my thesis required me to actually play test this game before I got it on the market. And as designers, we should play test our games anyways because it shows us the flaws. If you ever want to know what's wrong with a, your game, give it to a player. They will break it. <laughs> so here we go. Um, here are a few of the quotes that I found um, were really interesting. So. Uh, this one girl asked, did you guys know anyone in high school who came out? And they started talking about these different experiences and, and sharing with each other how, how difficult it must have been for people in high school to, to come out and, and be open and how strange it must have felt for them under all these social pressures. Um, so in, in that alone, it, it shows an empathizing at table that was moderated through this play space. And um, second quote was, I'm not always sure how to talk about some people because I'm afraid I will insult them. Like, what pronoun, pronoun do I use? And do any of you ever face this? Like, you either, either side, you don't know how to refer to someone because you're afraid you might insult them. And on the other hand, you kind of get insulted when people don't know how to, don't know how to talk to you. Um, and I, I think this, this is a great um, thing that's a great awareness in society that we're not all the gender that, or the sex, our gender identity doesn't always match the sex that we were born with. 
Um, some of us do want to transition, some of us don't. Some of us are wanting to express ourselves in different ways, and that's why I have painted nails now. Um, to continue, uh, this whole idea of drag family started bringing out this, uh, this different conversation to the table in how players didn't want other people to lose their family cards because um, like one person said, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have the people who supposedly love you the most turn their backs on you. Um, and if any of you have seen the, the documentary Paris is Burning, uh, a, a lot of uh, gay and lesbians, they, they run away from home because their parents don't accept them and they often find uh, an alternative family or one that will fulfill this uh, family role in their lives. Um, and it was, it's then strange how this turned into um, this other guy saying, I like this idea of being able to create your own family because if I had that ability, I would want you all to be in my family. And at that point, I, I just I had to sit down and write it down because it was it was so amazing the compassion that he showed, um, the empathy, and all this, and just to to know that this was being moderated in play space that reached people who might not have understood what this was like beforehand. Um, and if any of you are RuPaul fans, I I am, and I've recently gotten my parents into it. Um, <laughs> This last season, there was a touching moment between Rue and, and Roxy Andrews in which Ro Roxy started talking about being left behind at a bus stop when, when he was three years old with his sister. And then Rue turns to her and says, I am your family. We are your family. Um, and th this moment was just amazing. Um, so for those of you who like board games and want to design board games but don't necessarily know what channels to go through. There's this awesome um, company called The Game Crafter, which I actually uh, published my game on and it's uh, available now on The Game Crafter. Shameless plug. <laughs> um, but they, they uh, have uh, board game pieces, dice, uh, they print cards, it's, it's amazing. Uh, they will ship you as many uh, play tests, um, iterations as you want. Um, so develop if, if you're a board gamer. Um, look into it because you all have voices and I'm sure that you all have games that you want to play that you haven't seen played, even if they're board games. And the thing I like about board games especially is that you must physically sit at a table to play them with other people. Um, this is a great way to moderate uh, discussions and conversations and enter into dialogues. So, my point. Build games that you want to play. Um, look into designing. And everyone, like I said, everyone has a voice. There are tools for you to use as designers that um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that other people feel how you feel, or at least someone else. And in making games that you want to play, someone else probably feels the same way and would want to play this game too. Um, and use games to create these, these bridges of dialogue. So if you're having a problem, think about how you can talk about this with other people in game space, because it is safe for other people to enter into and understand. and and then lead to conversation. So thank you very much for coming to this panel. I hope you learned something. Um, I can answer any questions if you have them. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering 
Okay, so that's actually really interesting because the the drag family winning clause didn't come into play until um, one of my professors actually was playing with uh, three other students and she just started like, we have more items, we're more fabulous than you, we should win already. And it, it was just interesting because um, that in itself changed how um, I thought about the game and how, how people should win. And I, I do like co-op games like that. Um, another way was that players wanted to throw more shade at each other when they didn't perform. <laughs> And I intentionally left that out because sometimes that can be really mean. <laughs> but that didn't stop them. <laughs> yes? Uh, are there any other games that you kind of took as inspiration that also address um, gender as a topic? Or do you kind of feel like you're breaking new ground? I do feel like I was breaking new ground into this. Um, I, I personally hadn't seen any, any game that tried to break this gender um, binary. Like there, when when I start talking about my game and that you can dress up with pieces, um, players often uh, or other people are like, "Oh, like fashion plate," and I'm like, or I think there's like pretty princess or something that you also have like I I don't know. But yeah. they're like, pretty princess? What? Pretty, pretty, princess. pretty princess, yeah. Pretty, pretty princess, excuse me, yes. Um, excuse me, because she just can't be pretty. <laughs> but the problem with these games are um, that they're marketed towards, towards women, um, redefining that, that women need to be feminine. And I, I'm saying, why can't men be feminine too? Yes, sir. There's lots of games that tackle uh, like gender and sexual minority um, experiences, but it feels like they're kind of tacked on to traditional game mechanics. How important do you think it is to have mechanics that force players to interact with these subjects directly? Because I notice like the, the performing gender part, for instance, is part of the game mechanically mm -hmm. to interact with that. I'm gonna kind of go around this like roundabout answer, uh, but I will get to it. So um, in, in play, we have a spectrum. On one end, there's uh, Ludus, which is heavily structured play, which uh, like you said, would be that. And then on the other side, there's Padea, which is free play. Um, so like, oh, I'm trying to come up with an idea and it just, it all escaped me. But like coloring games that you can just kind of like, oh, now I want his, had to be red. Now I want it to be blue. That you can just kind of play around with it. Um, study, studies have shown that Paideia, if you want players to kind of create their own meaning, Paideia works better. If you want to um, directly tell a player what to do, Ludus, that's what you want to do. Um, because I wanted to um, have players make, make men act like women, I had to go for the Ludus, the Ludic type of play. Um, whereas if you wanted players to come up with their own conclusion and uh, see how it felt, that would be more Paideia. And I think I actually combined the two in uh, playtesting by actually having the items available. Because on the one hand, uh, you have to uh, play with the very rule-bound uh, mechanics of the game. But on the other, you're able to negotiate your own identity by putting on the items and feeling what it's like to to dress up and um, see how this affects you. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. So now that you're done with this, what's next? Do you have any more in, like in store that you're planning on thinking of? I, I do have a couple more games that I want to make. Um, the Game Crafter is really cool. They they even have competitions for you to make uh, board games and submit them to. Um, 
it's an interesting way to design, uh, but I, I want to continue on this idea of using play space to bridge conversations. Um, next time I'm looking into one that's more uh, kid friendly, a way for kids and parents to, to talk more. Yes, sir. Do you think you'll ever be uh, to a point where you can take a female centric and do the similar thing only with a feminine role? I, that, so so that, that, that's interesting. Um, me personally, I'm not sure how comfortable I would feel doing that because I, I, it would be harder for me to design from that perspective seeing as I am not of that identity. Um, so it would kind of be like a straight novelist writing gay literature. And if you've ever read any of that, that's really awkward. <laughs> Yes. Um, do you feel like, so like you talked about the magic circle and how you sort of assume suspension of disbelief versus just playing game. Do you feel that it allows you to talk about much more transgressive <coughs> subjects than you would say if you just wrote this, wrote this as a paper for your thesis? Oh. Yes. Um, I, actually, the, the magic circle is, is a place of, that, that you can perform transgressive acts that don't, aren't, aren't usually um, allowed in society. Um, Grand Theft Auto for <laughs> one example. Seeing as it was my thesis, I, I, I did struggle with it, I, I will admit that. Um, at one point, fans were a bit too powerful in what they did, um, and that created this whole balancing situation. Uh, friends kind of became this way that players were like, ah, they're not doing anything for me, screw them. Like, and they were just giving them away too easily, and I, I needed to find a way that, that made players rethink of these pieces that they were actually losing. Um, so, the because the message was was embedded into the mechanics as I had it, it, it needed to work on that level too. This is uh, something I sometimes find with games like this that carry an important social message is that um, sometimes the the message overrides the mechanics. And sometimes they don't really work as a game as such, and uh, and I think that can actually undermine the message that they're, that they're carrying. I agree with you. <laughs> uh, I, I believe I saw. Okay, one, two. Okay. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the simulation of the magic circle. Did you find in the course of your play testing that the, you needed to make allowances in the actual design of the game to sort of facilitate that uh, function, or was it just sort of that just sort of arise out of the players approach naturally? Interesting question. Um, so, my, this is actually really interesting. Um, my idea was that in the space created by coming to the game, that's where all this was, was going to take place. Um, in one playtest session, uh, we were playing in a room with, with glass walls, and as long as that, that barrier was there, people were fine playing the game, putting the items, dancing around, all that. Um, it wasn't until someone, like another student, walked in to set up for a meeting that everyone just went silent and it died. And before, when everyone was being campy and, and hooting at each other, and uh, then it just, you couldn't tell that anything was going on in there. We just, everyone started staring at each other. It was strange. And uh, could you speak more about the, uh, the craft and publishing side of what made it, how you took your idea and made it a physical product? 
what could you speak more of um, what avenues you used and how you made it a product? Okay, um, so I started off in this uh, very abstract form, and originally I wanted it to be this like complex deck building game, and players needed to get money, and you had like your beauty points and and I, I don't know, I started prototyping it with index cards and when I realized that there were like 17 different decks, I was like, this isn't gonna work. Um, so then I, I, I sat down with my advisor and we, we thought of um, a way that would still convey this message that I wanted it to, but was so uh, simplified. And then I began iterating on that. Um, at first I used index cards uh, that just had words on them. From there I um, developed the art and actually got my first um, my first prototype at about the um, A stage, the alpha alpha stage, um, printed, uh, introduced the items, and saw how the artwork impacted how players were playing the game. Um, and then the artwork, all that was done in Photoshop. The game, the game crafter actually provides the uh, formats, file size, all that that you need to have the cards in, send them the files, and they just they print it back to you, and it takes about a week and a half, depending on um, what you choose. And uh, from there, it was uh, taking notes on what players were doing, um, being vigilant about how they were playing your game, and um, both how you want them to, and especially what they're doing that is just what you don't want at all. And uh, being able to like quickly iterate upon your ideas and trying to, to change this and see how it affects uh, what you're trying to do with your game. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your conference.